Did you go to work 20 or 30 minutes after you drank a couple of sips of whiskey? He's got a badge. Federal Bureau, of, he's an FBI agent. He was the top counterintelligence official in charge of hunting spies. So federal prosecutors said he should have known better than to take money from a sanctioned Russian oligarch closely tied to Vladimir Putin. Where'd you get this? That's issue Issue two. Federal Bureau of Investigation badge. An FBI agent accidentally firing his gun at a nightclub. The bullet did hit someone in the leg who was rushed to the hospital. Ever wondered about the types of people cops have to deal with in their day-to-day -day lives? Petty offenders, white-collar criminals, violent offenders, organized crime, and the list goes on. But what happens when a cop has to arrest an FBI agent? So, continuing with our series, here are four more real-world cases that show what happens when an FBI agent gets on the wrong side of the law and is confronted by cops. But first, be sure to like this video as YouTube is not a fan of such kinds of videos. Now let's get on with the spicy stuff. Beginning today's video, we have a rather hilarious but unfortunate incident from Denver, Colorado, when an FBI agent accidentally discharged his gun on a bystander and want to know the craziest part? All this happened while the FBI agent was showing his dance moves, probably trying to woo some girls. On June 2, 2018, FBI agent Chase Bishop, after a hard day's work, was looking to blow off some steam. Once off duty, he went to the Mile High Spirits, a local bar in Denver to wind down his day, but little did he know that this evening would soon turn into one of the biggest regrets of his life. After consuming a few drinks, 29-year-old Chase hits the dance floor, showcasing his moves that clearly seem like an attempt to show off in front of the encouraging crowd before him. He then goes a step further and attempts a backflip in front of his fans. But what happened next quickly turned the fun evening into a horror show. As he performed the backflip, his gun fell out of its holster and onto the floor. When he bent down to pick it up, the gun accidentally discharged and the bullet struck a bystander in the leg. Now that's the FBI agent right there. He's dancing in front of a crowd, does a backflip, and then drops his gun. That flash, that's when his gun went off. The bullet did hit someone in the leg who was rushed to the hospital. The agent doesn't realize it at first and can be seen walking off with a big shrug, but pretty soon that lively evening turned into a nightmare for him when he saw what he did. The victim, 24-year-old Tom Reddington, immediately went down as soon as the bullet hit him in the leg. All of a sudden, my, from the knee down, became completely red. And that's when it clicked in my head, oh, I've been shot. However, the Denver police did not immediately arrest the FBI agent, releasing him to his FBI supervisor. To his bad luck, the entire incident was caught on camera, and the footage circulated widely, attracting public attention and media coverage. Agent Chase Bishop was arrested more than a week later and was charged with the Class 4 felony, punishable by two to six years in prison and a fine of up to $500,000. The case was later pushed to the courts as the FBI agent pleaded guilty to his charge. Fortunately for him, he was acquitted by the court after cutting a deal with the prosecutor. Instead of jail time, Chase was sentenced to two years probation. He was also fined $1,200 and ordered to pay restitution to the victim. You'd think Tom Reddington, the man Chase shot in the leg, wouldn't be too happy about that, but he was surprisingly chill about the whole thing. There was no pointing, there was no aiming. I don't Explain the guy. I don't want to ruin his life. I just want a private phone call from this guy. To his credit, Agent Chase reportedly apologized to Reddington, who was also in court during the hearing. Agent Chase got off way too easy if you ask us. Or perhaps there's a hidden lesson here for law enforcement officers on how to handle their firearms during off-duty hours. But sadly, the world is full of boneheads. And not every law enforcement officer is the sharpest tool in the shed. Certainly not this agent here. On June 15th, just two weeks after the Chase Bishop incident, another incident unfolded in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, involving yet another FBI agent. Agent Markham King from Cheyenne, Wyoming, was down in Steamboat Springs to attend a youth baseball tournament when his gun accidentally went off. The reason? Pure and simple stupidity. But unlike the Chase Bishop case, the Steamboat Springs police were quick to arrive on the scene. Let's hear what Markham has to say. Hey, what's happening? How you doing? I'm Brent. Markham. Markham? Markham. Pleasure Markham. To meet you. Yeah. What's going on? You heard of a technical clip? Uh huh. Let me show you. Alright. Oh, yeah, yeah. Clear? Yep. Right? Yep. So, taking clip inside. Okay. Here. Yep. I go to pull up my pants, and that's what happened to index. Okay. Bang. Shish. Through my pants here. I stand straight up, hits the bleachers. Go straight, straight through my pants here. Oh. Right into the bleachers. Because I was like, hey, yeah, it was me. You know, it was me. Because I, I went to sit down and enjoy the game. Yeah. And I went to pull up my pants, indexed, yep. and cranked one off, so. 
What our special agent is trying to explain here is that while watching the game, he had his gun in what is known as a Techna Clip, a concealable gun clip that easily affixes to your sidearm to deliver a secure, lightweight, and discreet carry option without a holster, something that most officers are prohibited from using because of the lack of a trigger guard. It's the dumbest thing you can put on a gun. It's unsafe um, because it <laughs> because of exactly what happened. A logic that seems completely lost to Markham and his partner who, rather than grasping the seriousness of the matter, swiftly jumps to defend Markham. I always check to him because he's always got everything under control every time we're around. You know, and I was like, I said, he was sat down, sat down, looked down. It was, it, was so, it was so surreal to me. So I, I do it and I'm like, I hear it. I'm like, mm -hmm. I know what it is. I'm like, no. Yeah. Holding my pants. Shoot. So. All right. That's it, man. Did you catch how casually Markham treated the whole situation? The guy was surrounded by kids for crying out loud, and that's all he has to say in his explanation. Jesus Christ, officer. Show some accountability, will you? Something he was soon about to learn when another supervisor from Steamboat Springs called Rich Brown confronted him, and it turned out that Officer Brown had just all the right questions to ask him. Hey, Markham. Hey. I'm Rich Brown. Well, I'm concerned about this, obviously, you know, okay, as a law enforcement officer. Um, how much have you had to drink today? Uh, about four or five sips. I had mixed a, um, a whiskey and a ginger ale. When was that? It was a, it was about a, about a half an hour, 45 minutes ago. Um, probably about, I guess a chef, about 20 minutes ago. Wow, did you hear that? As Officer Brown grills Markham about the incident, suddenly things become clearer. The agent admits to being under the influence, and that too while his gun went off. Not only what Markham did was highly inappropriate, but also completely illegal. It's illegal for off-duty law enforcement officers to carry their firearms in public places when under the influence. Wonder how that slipped out of Markham's mind given all his training to become a federal agent. That's the thing that's running through my mind that worries me about this. It, if the thought enters your mind that you should put this handgun away, right. that in itself tells me you know you personally have some concern about that. And I understand what you're saying. I've been doing this job a long time. And, you know, you're sitting in bleachers with other people. Uh, I, sorry, I Looks like Officer Brown here is taking our special agent to school on how to be a federal agent. Well, Markham, that's what you get when you come across a seasoned law enforcement officer. Officer Brown then instructs Markham to take a breathalyzer test, which of course Markham failed as his blood alcohol level was just above the legal limit. What's even more concerning is that some time has passed since the incident, so in all likelihood, the agent was more intoxicated when the fiasco happened. The officers had no choice but to charge Markham with criminal charges, and he was issued a summon for reckless endangerment and disorderly conduct. All right, man. Um, gonna issue a summons, okay? Yep. Um, for disorderly conduct, reckless endangerment, both require that you go to court. The court's decision is not available for public disclosure, but rumor has it that Markham is still working for the agency. Tell you what, Markham sure slipped through the cracks of the judicial system, but he must be praying day and night that fortunately for him, the bullet just hit the bleacher as the alternative is just so damn terrifying. At least agents Chase and Markham can be forgiven for their account of negligence, but our next agent broke all boundaries and violated every oath he swore by doing something truly horrible and disgusting. This is Mark Allen Wells a former special FBI agent from Tulsa, Oklahoma, who has now been revoked from his special agent status after he was charged with what's commonly known as revenge porn, which means sharing private, intimate photos of others without their consent. As we mentioned before, truly disgusting. Before we get into further details, let us introduce you to two other characters in this story. Morgan Ballou, a woman who dated Mark on and off for several years and Savannah Smith, his girlfriend and fiance at the time, who was engaged to Mark till last May when the whole thing came to light. Both these women met Mark through online dating apps, completely unaware of his explicit lifestyle. All the green boxes that a girl would check. 
Savannah even went to the extent of selling her house and relocating with her daughter from another state to live with Mark, after Mark proposed to her. And who knows things could have worked for Mark, and he would have carried on with his disgusting fantasies till today. But to his bad luck, his karma came calling in May last year, after three women, Morgan, his ex-wife, and another anonymous woman came forward claiming Mark shared explicit photos and videos of them without their consent. According to court records, investigators were assigned to the case when one of the victims approached the authorities informing them that Mark showed her a large photo album with multiple sub-albums inside. Each sub-album was titled with the woman's name and included their corresponding nude photos. The woman also pointed out another victim who had lodged a previous complaint after authorities showed her explicit photos from the previous complaint. Soon, Morgan too was brought into the loop and she confessed that he recorded a video of her participating in sexual acts without her knowledge. After collecting enough evidence, a search warrant was issued and in just a matter of time, the cops came banging at Mark's doorsteps. What was that like? Kind of walk me through that. Uh, it was terrifying. I was very caught off guard. Um, so I was just there cleaning house and I heard a knock on the door and there was five officers with guns pointed. Mark was promptly arrested, despite denying all charges and attempting to use his position as an FBI agent to influence the police. However, the officers were not swayed by his attempts. Later, an extensive search of his house took place, and the officers were shocked to know the depth of this man's creepiness. The search warrant recovered a total of 55 private albums, including thousands of private photos, with the majority of photos and videos sexual in nature and indicating they were possibly recorded in secret. There was also multiple Nest camera footage, and after due search, the officers were able to find three Nest cameras inside his home, all hidden away from plain sight. Good lord, how disgusting this guy can get. Mark was charged with one count of peeping Tom with photographic and electronic equipment and three counts of non-consensual dissemination of private sexual images. So far, the authorities have identified multiple women from the evidence, but the verification process is far from over. According to the affidavit, there could be more victims. Statements in the affidavit indicate there could be upwards of 80. Although Mark was effectively removed from his office, he was later released on bond and the case is still ongoing. Ladies, while in Tulsa, please watch out for this man as predators like him just don't fall out of their habits and are constantly looking out for ways to satisfy their inner fetish. Moving on, our next story revolves around a former top counterintelligence official at the FBI's New York office, who, forget about being true to his oaths, went far ahead and committed the highest level of treason by violating U.S. sanctions and colluding with various foreign parties for his own personal interests. Charles McGonagall, a 22-year veteran of the FBI, found himself in a tornado of trouble after he was arrested at JFK International Airport in January 2023 on multiple charges related to two separate cases. The first case, filed in federal court in Washington, D.C., accused McGonagall of accepting $225,000 in cash from Albanian-American Agron Nezal a former spy for Albanian intelligence officers. Prosecutors claimed he took the money while he was actively serving in the New York's office and concealed it from the FBI for a very long time. Additional allegations suggested McGonagall influenced the Prime Minister of Albania, Edi Rama, regarding oil-filled drilling licenses in favor of Russian front companies. There were also accusations that the FBI executive received $80,000 in cash while in a parked car outside a restaurant in New York City. In Washington, McGonagall faced a nine-count indictment charging him with failing to report cash payments, contacts with foreign officials, and trips to Europe he took with Nezaj in 2017 and 2018 that neither he nor the FBI paid for. McGonagall pleaded guilty last September to accepting $225,000 from Agron Nezaj and later admitted that Nezaj was helping him foster a relationship in Albania to help lay the groundwork for future business opportunities in the country. Looks like somebody was in a hurry to plan out their retirement plan, right? According to court documents, Nizaj became an informant for the FBI's investigation into McGonagall's contacts and activities in Albania. The guilty plea was entered in the U.S. District Court of the District of Columbia in Washington. Based on a deal between prosecutors and McGonagall's lawyers, he admitted guilt for one count, specifically concealing material evidence while prosecutors dropped the remaining eight charges. With this resolution, the case did not proceed to trial, and McGonagall later apologized to the court for his actions. Didn't see that coming, did you? Isn't it frustrating how these corrupt officials use loopholes in our judiciary system to escape from the law? However, the same cannot be said for the next case McGonagall was accused of. The second case filed in New York alleged that during McGonagall's FBI tenure, he collaborated with a Russian translator named Sergei Shestakov, who was also a former Soviet Union and Russian diplomat. 
It was later revealed that Shestakov was working for a Russian oligarch and a close ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin named Oleg Deripaska. Deripaska was sanctioned by the U.S. government for interfering with the 2016 elections and his role in enabling Russia's annexation of Crimea, a fact very well known to McGonagall. While still in office, McGonagall was introduced to a Russian intelligence officer and Deripaska's agent by Shestikov. The Russian agent, following Deripaska's instruction, asked McGonagall to help him secure an internship for his daughter at the New York City Police Department in the fields of counterterrorism, intelligence gathering, and international liaisoning. Of course, the corrupt McGonagall agreed to help. Geez, sometimes we wonder why we have to worry about external threats when we have guys like these doing a bang-up job for them. But this is not where his list of crimes ends. After he retired from the agency in 2018, McGonagall met with Deripaska and other oligarchs in London and Vienna, who connected him with a law firm in New York to help him get off the U.S. sanctions list. The law firm retained McGonagall as a consultant and investigator on the Deripaska matter for a fee of $25,000 per month. In the following years, McGonagall started working directly for Deripaska using shell companies and forged signatures to receive payments from the Russian oligarchy, all the while trying to conceal his involvement from the FBI. He was also involved in helping Deripaska dig up dirt and investigate his rival oligarch, Vladimir Potanin. And if these crimes were not enough, McGonagall again violated U.S. sanctions in 2021 by supplying information to Deripaska to help him find loopholes to evade sanctions. In exchange, McGonagall received $17,500 from Deripaska, laundered from Gazprom Bank in Russia to Cyprus to a business bank account in New Jersey, and then McGonagall's private account. Hey, when you have been in the top agency for 22 long years, finding these little loopholes comes easy, especially for a corrupt official like McGonagall. But as they say, karma always comes calling and there's no escape from that hellhole. McGonagall was using a subcontractor to locate files about Patanin on the dark web and was negotiating a $3 million sale of those files when he came under the FBI's radar. Upon seizing his phone and other personal electronic items, the officials were shocked to see the extent of McGonagall's betrayal towards his own country and was promptly put under arrest. Imagine the shame. The same officer who gave his life working for the institution finds himself in cuffs by the same institution. Well, that's what you get for treason, Officer McGonagall. The FBI guy after me for the Russia, Russia, Russia hoax, long before my election as president, was just arrested for taking money from Russia, Russia, Russia. May he rot in hell. Of course, he denied all charges at first, but as more evidence came to light, McGonagall had no option but to plead guilty in August 2023, hoping he could avoid jail time by leaving himself to the mercy of law, just like he did in his first case. However, Judge Jennifer Reardon had something else in mind and came cracking down on him, sentencing him for a period of 50 months in prison. In addition to the prison sentence, McGonagall was also ordered to pay a $40,000 fine, forfeit $17,500, and serve three years of supervised release. That sounds about right, given the gravity of crimes, wouldn't you agree, folks? Not only did McGonagall violate the trust his country placed in him by using his high-level position at the FBI, but what's even more appalling is the fact that he did all those things for his greed. And for that, there is absolutely no forgiveness. That's it for today, folks. Hope you have liked the video. Don't forget the other parts of this series popping on your screen and we will catch you in the next one.